I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. Well, that created quite a little stir. Uh, this morning we are going to continue and begin the second half, the down slope of our series on biblical manhood. I want to take a moment and just kind of uh, briefly review with you where we've been, and then I want to tell you where we're going to go. Uh, first session was, and by the way, I've decided to change the names of the messages, and so, uh, but session one, a man's wiring diagram, and that session we talked about, we are, we are images of God, but we are also fallen, so we have dignity and depravity, and uh, we just kind of talked about God's purpose for man. Uh, session two, a man marked by humility. Even if you're right, you're wrong. If you're not humble. Third session, a man who is born again. It's not enough to be religious. You must be born again. The fourth session, a man with the habit of desiring God. I will make it my habit to each day desire nothing more than God. Session five, a man pursuing a clean heart. I will invite Jesus to create in me, as David did, uh, prayed a clean heart. Session six was a man and his world of view. And uh, I think the big idea was I will let Jesus be Jesus in my world view. I think having thought about that, I wish I had that one back. Actually, every talk I've ever given I would walk away and wish I would have done four or five things differently. But anyway, for a man in his worldview, we, we've talked here in years past about this idea from Frederick Taylor, the father of scientific management. Your system is perfectly designed to produce the result you're getting. I think a good, a good or maybe even a better big idea for a man in his worldview would be to say that your worldview is perfectly designed to produce the results you're getting. And so that it's important for us to make, make room for the supernatural in our world view. Now this morning, we're going to do a man balancing faith and effort. Uh, then we will do a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. Session 9 will be a man created to worship. Session 10 will be a man consecrated to obedience. Session 11 will be a man winning his spiritual struggle. And session 12 will be a man making a contribution. So you can kind of get some of the themes that are going there. All right, go ahead and you know, get comfortable, turn your chairs if you need to do that, and we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 4. A father was helping his children get ready for bed. And the little children were brushing their teeth and his five-year-old son accidentally dropped his toothbrush in the toilet. He took it out and was getting ready to use it again and his father said, son, uh, once your toothbrush has fallen in the toilet, you need to throw it away. So they put it in the trash can and uh, his little boy disappeared. A couple minutes later, he came back and he had his dad's toothbrush. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, dad, I dropped this one in the toilet about two weeks ago. <laughs> A true test of biblical manhood. Well, that's a small struggle, but, uh, you know, we have a lot of struggles in life, a lot of opposition. And uh, I want to read to you, I'm just going to read to you Psalm chapter 90, verse 10 out of the New Living Translation. Seventy years are given to us, some may even reach eighty, but even the best of these years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we are gone. Even the best of our years are filled with pain and trouble and challenges and tribulations and so forth. And there's just a lot of opposition in life. I mean, I've had a rough couple of weeks. Of course, my mother passed, and that's had its own set of challenges. 
Also, you know, man in the mirror, the ministry, it's, you know, I'm, you know, this a ministry is a business. You understand this, right? I mean, if you think a ministry is not a business and you go into ministry, you're going to be out of ministry because you're going to be out of business. A ministry is a business. I mean, it has the, it has the, the goal of sharing the gospel with, in our case, with men and helping them grow in their faith. But it is a business. And Man in the Mirror is now a $3 million business. And so it's, uh, it's grown very rapidly these last two or three years. And along with that come all the challenges. And so the, the biggest challenge is the, is, the, is the funding. How do you, you know, it, the more rapidly a business grows, the more cash it eats, right? And so you, a, a rapidly growing business always has cash flow problems. Well, I have been spending, we don't have a development director. I'm it. I, I, am, I am the development director. And about 38% of our, of our income is donations, and the rest of it you know, is through resource sales and seminars and Project Father's Day and things like that. Well, <clears throat> I'm spending about half of my time now in the in the fundraising area, and it just it's it, it's 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 getting old, you know. It's just getting old. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, I would like to be writing more. I would like to be doing some other things, and and uh, it just gets old. So I'm talking to a donor, uh, you know, and we're struggling. Okay, I'm one payroll down right now. Today I'm one payroll down. That's not bad after 53 years to only be one payroll behind, you know. But I'm one payroll down. I'm and and uh, you know, yesterday some things happened, and I think that's going to be probably okay. We'll see on Tuesday. But um, <laughs> whether the checks bounce or not. <laughs> but the uh, I'm talking to uh, one of to a donor, and uh, he gives me this wonderful um, textbook speech that money follows ministry, that where God is working, the money will be there. And, you know, besides wanting to strangle him, <laughs> I said, you know, I, I said, well, I said, well, I tell you what, then God must not be in our ministry. And he must not be in any other ministry to men in the United States, because as the president of the National Coalition of Men's Ministries, I don't know of a single ministry to men that's doing well financially. Not one of them. Every, every single one of them is always strapped for money. And why is that? Well, if you were the devil, <laughs> and there are 63 million men who do not profess faith in Christ, and 90 million men who are not involved in discipleship, uh, this would be a quite a quite a coup for you, quite a victory, and uh, and I would think it would be territory that you would want to be able to maintain. So there's a lot of opposition. You know, Henry Blackaby, whom I love, has a very famous saying: "Find out where God is working and join Him there." But a lot of people really now get this wrong. They don't understand what Henry meant. He didn't mean find out where the money's flowing, find out where people are, you know, just falling out of trees to come to Christ. That's not what he meant, but that's what a lot of people have corrupted his little thought to mean. Now think about it. Find out where God is working and join in there. Now, if you use that Americanized understanding of this, then Jesus was a total failure in his ministry. Because he had thousands, and he only ended up with 40. You know, he preached his whole deal down to 40. So if you want to use some sort of Americanized thing, of course, Henry's from Canada, so he probably has a different point of view, right? But the idea, find out where God is working and joining there. God is doing incredible things in the lives of men. But the reality is, is that the, the devil has created a lot of opposition to, to funding that. You have your own oppositions. Some of you right now have family feuds going on over wills, the adjudication of a, of a will. Or some of you have family feuds going on over the care of aging parents. 
Some of you are feuding with your, have this power struggle going on with your wife about how are we going to raise these kids of ours. Some of you are in opposition today because you have a vendor who is jerking you around. He, he owes you money, you know he has the money, and he's not paying you, and you can't pay your bills because he's not paying yours. And so you have opposition from the vendor, and you have opposition from the people that you, uh, that you have your own bills due to. And you're trying to figure out how to make your own little payrolls. You know, find that after my 20-year business career, I find that my conclusion is that what business really is about is arguing about who gets to keep the money. I mean, what's all said and done, what business is about is arguing about who gets to keep the money. So, or maybe you've got some sort of an unfulfilled dream, unfulfilled calling, and you just feel like there's been opposition. It could be for 20 years you've wanted to do this calling, and you just always feel like you're blocked from it. Or maybe you're just like me, you're just sort of tired of the daily battles, you know? Just tired of the daily battles. You know, I'm... I'm I told somebody the other day, you know, I'm tired of living by faith. <laughs> now, our question in this that I said I've been organizing us around is this question. Who are the men in Scripture we most admire and why, and what do they have in common? And we see some uh, great examples of men in the Bible who have faced similar oppositions to you and I, or, or greater. Men like Abraham, uh, Moses, Joseph, uh, David, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the fire they say, God will deliver us, but even if he doesn't deliver us, we will not bow to you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Men of great passion for God who are facing great opposition. And then men like Nehemiah, the man I want us to look at this morning. How did these men face their opposition? Let's take a look at our text. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. The background, Nehemiah has been... Uh, in the uh, part of the exiled community, he did not return to Israel. I think the exiles have been back in Jerusalem for about 11 years. They had not rebuilt the temple. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, the, the, the town was still in a shambles. There had not been much progress in the 11 years. And God puts a burden on Nehemiah's heart to, to rebuild Jerusalem. So he gets the resources, he gets the, the, the money, he gets the people, he gets to Jerusalem, he has a plan, and they start to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, op uh, opposition comes out of the woodwork. Verse 1, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. Now, you picture just somebody here, who becomes angry and greatly incensed and starts to ridicule. And you've had people like this who, who no longer, you know, most, most of the time, even if you have an enemy, they're civil, you know. Uh, and, and so they're kind, of, they're kind of getting you around the back end, you know. And, but, but, but you've also had an opponent who now has abandoned all care about whether or not you, you, you think they're a nice guy or not anymore. And they are letting you have it. They are angry, they're incensed, and they're ridiculing you, and you've had this happen. Yes, if you haven't had it happen, well, you will. So, he ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? And so forth. And then down in verse 4, Nehemiah's answer to this, Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. And then down in verse 6, So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Worked with all their heart. First thing we see 
is that if we do God's will, we can expect opposition. If you, if you are doing God's will, you can expect opposition. The wheat and the tares, they're just always there together. That's the kingdom order. I would have done it differently, but he doesn't, he doesn't check with me on these things. He lets the wheat and the tares grow up together. And then at the end, the wheat gets taken into the barn. The tares get burned. But until then, wheat and tares together. If you're doing God's will, you can expect opposition. That's the first thing we see. Second, we must depend absolutely on God in faith. We must depend absolutely on God in faith. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. He turns to God in faith. He does not depend on his own abilities. Third, even though we depend absolutely on God in faith, we must absolutely be prepared to do whatever it takes to be faithful with our abilities. Faith and effort working together here. Now, you see this happen again. One, two, three, send ballot. Here, so God, we trust you. Number three, we rebuilt. We, we, we took responsibility. We, 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 we put forth the effort. You see, one, two, three. Now you see it again, verse seven. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. So there's your opposition. Verse 9. Nehemiah says, But we prayed to our God, there's the faith, and posted a guard. There's the responsibility. There's the effort. So we prayed and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Moody uh, has had a saying... We pray like it is all up to God. We work like it is all up to us. We pray as though it's all up to God. We work as though it's all up to us. So basically it's praise the Lord and pass the ammunition here. You see. Question. Would a farmer expect to take in a harvest if he hadn't planted anything or hadn't put down any fertilizer or hadn't spread any water? Would a soldier expect to win a war if he didn't practice on how to shoot a target? Would a businessman expect a profit if he didn't uh, exercise some diligence to sell his products? Of course not. It's the effort is required. Now I want to do a little excursus here with you <clears throat> and I want to I want to acquaint some of you for the first time with two words and for some of you it will be a reacquaintance these are words that are biblical words that you don't hear a lot about today but in some circles you do Justification and sanctification. Justification is what? It is, it is the moment, if you will, that we are saved. It is being declared righteous in the sight of God, legally declared righteous in the sight of God because of what Jesus did on the cross, dying for our sins. And we take hold of our justification, as Bill here has said, by faith alone. You've heard this many times here, and hopefully you've heard it elsewhere too, that we are saved by faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone. It's faith alone, right? Justification is by faith alone, not by works, not by effort, right? How, what role do, does your effort play in your salvation? Okay. In terms of gaining your salvation, zero is the correct answer. It's the merit of Jesus. It's not your merit. It does not depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. So, in, 
the process of us becoming saved, our justification, it's by faith alone. Now, once a man becomes a Christian, the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the Bible says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So once we have gained our salvation, then we have a responsibility to become holy. Now, who makes us holy? How do we become sanctified? Well, once we start talking about sanctification, we, not, not, we talk about we're sanctified by faith in the same way that we are justified by faith. Those of you who, uh, this is a little obtuse, this section here, I try to give something almost every week for those who are a little bit more theologically minded. If this is a little too obtuse for you, just forget it, okay? Just forget it. But I think it's worth knowing. I think it's worth knowing. Justification is by faith alone. Sanctification depends upon both faith and effort. In other words, God does expect us to apply effort to become Christ-like through faith. Now, I'm going to give you here in a moment a number of scriptures that will help you understand this. But I want to, before I do that, I want to show you two errors. Two errors that uh, I'm going to guess that some of us here have probably in the past, probably not now, we probably have it all straightened out by now, but it's possible that somebody in the past may have made one of these two errors. <clears throat> and uh, the, the, the first error is the error of faith without effort. Now, there is a whole movement. I'm, I should have given you a little bibliography. I'll just mention one book here uh, by Kenneth Pryor, The Way of Holiness. And uh, he has outlined two movements uh, that... Um, have made errors in this whole idea of the relationship between faith and effort. And uh, the, the, the first error, faith without effort, is the uh, error of quietism. Now, does anybody possibly know which religious group are the quietists? Quakers. The Quakers, the Quakers... Uh, started this quietism movement, this, this idea of faith without effort. It's just that I surrender all, okay? uh, let go and let God, that I don't do anything, that God is doing everything. God is the one that's making me holy, and I don't have to do anything to cooperate with that. I'm overstating the case here to make the point. But it's, it's, it's faith without effort. And, and I would prefer to say for our purposes that our error might be faith without enough effort. Okay? Faith without enough effort. And you can see how these people can uh, make some grave mistakes thinking that uh, thinking they don't have to uh, strive to be more Christ-like. Don't have to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, as the scriptures say. What's the other effort, uh, other, uh, other error then? Well, the first effort is faith without effort, first mistake. Then the second mistake would obviously be effort without faith. Now, what movement is this? This is, this comes out of a 17th century movement called the pietists pietism pietism don't don't try to remember this but it's a very important movement because most of the evangelical christianity today is, this was a pietism was a reaction to some errors in the german lutheran church in the 17th century and it was a wonderful movement because it really emphasized small group bible study small groups now you know 
Christianity in America is heavily focused on small group ministry, and it's good. And that came out of this movement. But this movement basically is all about practical Christianity, all about me doing in my own strength what needs to get done. So it's, it's a lot of effort, but without much faith. And so you might just be able to think about your own life and see some ways where you might make uh, one of these two errors. The scripture says that how we should handle op opposition, first of all, we expect opposition, but we depend on God, but we take responsibility. So it's not either faith or effort, it's both. It's both. And I don't know what it is about the human psyche that has such a difficult time holding that these two things in mind at the same time, but that's what the scriptures teach. Now, I'm... I'm just, going to say, I'm, not, I'm just going to take you through a few passages. You can write down the addresses here because I'm going to go through them very quickly. Nehemiah 4.9 says, but we prayed and posted a guard. We prayed, there's faith, and we posted a guard. And so we could say we post a guard as we pray. Proverbs 21, verse 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. Now think about this. The horse is made ready for the day of battle. There's effort. But victory rests with the Lord. So it's up to God. So it's up to us. It's up to God. We do our part. We put forth effort. We make the horse ready for the day of battle. We, we do the business plan. We, we make the sales call. We provide the service. We do our part. And then God gives the victory. <laughs> God incites the vendor to pay his bill when we send it to him. You say, that's the way it is. All right? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in God. Faith, trust in God. Don't lean on your own understanding. What's implied in that? You don't lean on your own understanding. It's that you've taken the time to develop an understanding upon which you don't rely. There's the effort. You have to put forth the effort. You have to be... I'm just totally aside. Thanksgiving Leadership Prayer Breakfast Committee. Chairman, 25 years. This year, I'm going to turn the reins over to a younger group of leaders. And so I recruited some guys to come in and, and uh, be the new leadership team, the new chairman, everything. And, and I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, I'm going to mentor these guys and kind of show them, you know, how to be the prayer breakfast people, you know. So these guys come in and they have more ideas. They're just popping off odd ideas. They're mentoring me. And, and you know what I thought about? It took me weeks to figure this out. I said, you know, our group, our little group has been together for years. And the problem is, is that when you've been together for a long time, you pretty much have all the, all the thoughts that that group of people have, you know. And, and, and so if you want to have any new thoughts, you have to get some new people in. So you, we got these new people in and got all these new thoughts. But there is another way to get some new thoughts. And that's to read. The, if you read widely you will have all kinds of new thoughts coming into your brain. And so if you want to understand, if you want to have an understanding, you can sit around and pray and wait, you know, have faith without effort, wait for this, you know, wait for these ideas, you know, these biblical truth, these knowledge, this word from on high to kind of somehow osmote into you, or you can read your Bible. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's the effort. What's the next verse say? Somebody. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. As we work, God works. That's your big idea, man. As we work, God works. We have to do our part. If we do not put forth effort, it is, not, it is not sound mind principle that God would bless a son who is lazy. 
it is not a sound mind principle that a son who is always working his dad, you know, you think, I'm a dad, you know, if your son is working you, I mean, you're just a little flea bite human. If you know that your son's working you, you think God doesn't know it when you're working him? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Run with perseverance the race marked out for you. There's the effort. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter or of our faith, the sanctifier of our faith. We persevere, that's our part. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the justifier and the sanctifier of our faith. It's, you see what I'm trying to show you is that this is throughout the Bible. Everything, everything after the moment you become a Christian is faith and effort working together. As we work, God works. As we work, God works. That's the deal. But it's tough, you know, <laughs> because these oppositions are out there and uh, it just grinds you down. I've mentioned this book here before, Good to Great. I may have even mentioned what I'm getting ready to mention about this book. I can't remember. <laughs> but it's, it's, there's a principle in here called the Stockdale Paradox. Admiral Jim Stockdale was the highest ranking military officer in the Hanoi Hilton as a prisoner of war during the Vietnam struggle. He was in prison for eight years. He was tortured 20 times. Uh, one time they wanted to use him for propaganda and he beat his face with a chair and cut himself with a razor blade to disfigure himself so that he couldn't be used as propaganda. When he finally got out of court, he did win the Congressional Medal of Honor, was awarded that, and, but he uh, has permanent disfigurement. He has to arc swing his stiff leg and has some other problems that uh, went along with that. And uh, Collins, the author of this book, Good to Great, had the opportunity to interview him. And he wanted to, uh, to find out, um, you know, how, how did Stockdale survive when he didn't know how the story would end? Because he had read the book, Stockdale's book, and, he, you know, he knew how it ended, and he was depressed reading the book. How could Stockdale make it? when he didn't know how it would all turn out. Here's Stockdale's answer. I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining moment of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. So then, Collins says to Stockdale, well, who didn't make it? Stockdale said, oh, that's easy, the optimists. Now, Collins, the author of the book, is really confused. What do you mean, the optimists? He said, well, those were the men who said, we'll be out by Christmas. And Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And they'd still be in there. And then they would say, well, we'll be out by Easter. And then Easter would come and Easter would go and they'd still be in there. And then they said, well, 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 surely we'll be out by Thanksgiving. And then Thanksgiving would come and Thanksgiving would go and they died of a broken heart. And so the principle that Stockdale, what, what the office called the Stockdale Paradox, is this, the idea that you retain faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. And at the same time, confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. And isn't that Christianity? We face our opposition with an absolute understanding that we know how the story ends, an absolute, resolute belief that we will prevail no matter what. And at the same time, through faith and effort, a willingness to confront the most brutal facts of our present reality. You have to get out of bed. You have to go after it. 
You, it, it, you can't just sit around and be consumed by anxiety. Don't be anxious, the scriptures say. You have to, as Paul Myers told me yesterday, Paul Myers told me yesterday, he's talking to a young man in Singapore, just riddled with all kinds of anxieties. He said, said get a grip. Read your Bible. Get a grip. Read your Bible. As we work, God works. If you don't work, why should you expect God to work? So yesterday morning, I was prepared to give you a totally different illustration of a man defeated, utterly defeated, me. Because I was. Yesterday morning, you'd, I was so low, you would have had to jack me up to bury me. I was so low yesterday morning. And, you know, I'm preparing this message. Part of what I'm doing yesterday is finishing off this message. And I say, Lord, I said, you know, how can I go tell these men to, to work <laughs> and to put forth effort uh, and then to have faith? Lord, I just, I'm, working, I'm working myself silly here, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm trying to do it out of the overflow of prayer and asking you to lead me and guide me. But I'm dying here. You know, I'm dying here. How can I go tell these men this? And then, so I'm making calls yesterday trying to, you know, rustle up payroll. Yesterday afternoon, like about 3 o'clock, a guy that's not on my call list a guy who has already told me he doesn't want to support the ministry calls me and says, I'd like to give you $60,000 to hire a development director. See, his passion is to help, help people in ministries uh, get the CEOs of rapidly growing ministries uh, properly staffed with the development director so you don't have to worry about this for the next 20 years so I just couldn't help but say um, it's faith and it's effort and then it's God doing whatever he wants to do but he's faithful we will prevail you will prevail and you have to hold on to this idea that you will prevail against all the odds. And at the same time, face whatever the most brutal facts of your current reality. You take responsibility. You do what you need to do in dependence upon God. As you work, He works. Let's pray. Amen. Father, I want to pray this morning for these men. Lord, there's some of, these, some of these brothers here this morning who are going through incredible oppositions. And uh, they are feeling this morning like I was feeling yesterday morning. And they need a sign of your goodness. I pray you would give it to them. And Father, for those of us who have been trying to depend on faith but not putting forth effort, I pray that you would you show us clearly what we need to do. And for those of us who have been putting forth effort but not putting enough faith in you, self, too much self-reliance, that you would show us what we need to do as well. And that uh, you would be glorified through this. Lord, uh, help, uh, help us to renew our faith in Jesus this morning. And Father, I pray that you would help men to, who are in these different oppositions to go out today and put forth the effort that's needed to take responsibility as they are in dependence upon you to produce whatever result would be good, pleasing, and perfect in your sight and will. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.